we need to understand better the forces of change and we need to respect the forces of change around us and adapt our practices in response to that. Business of Architecture, episode 268. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enix Sears and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a more profitable and impactful architecture and design practice. Today's guest is Daryl Condon, the managing partner of HMCA Architects, a firm with 80 people based out of Vancouver, British Columbia. They also have an office in Victoria. Now, on this show, we have the opportunity to jump into what Daryl calls a multidisciplinary practice, his ideas on the future of architecture, how they've been able to pull in people from other disciplines to fuel their growth exponentially and offer other services to their clients. It's a fascinating conversation, especially with regard to Daryl talking about uh, the pressures that are on architecture firms nowadays to deliver more in less time at higher quality quality and ultimately with less budget and just required to do more. And so Daryl talks about how they've been responding to this, how they've been bringing in a multidisciplinary team. And he really talks about his thoughts about how to be successful in the next 10 to 20 years. It's a great conversation. I know you're going to love it. As a podcast listener, get free instant access to my four-part architecture firm profit map video by going to freearchitectgift.com. Today's episode is sponsored by Gusto and Sage Glass. Gusto is a done-for-you payroll service that takes the hassle out of managing payroll, paying taxes, and onboarding new staff. Customers report that it takes seven minutes on average to run their payroll with Gusto. It's super easy to use and you can add benefits and HR support to take care of your team and keep your business safe. I first heard about this with uh, when I was talking to one of my clients who's in the Architect CEO program, William Eatson, based out of Southern California. He said it was a game changer. So I'm happy to share this with you. And they have a special bonus for podcast listeners. You can get three free months free when you run your first payroll. Go to gusto.com forward slash BOA to get your free three months. Sage Glass is the manufacturer of highly intelligent, reliable, dynamic glass. Sage Glass tends automatically to optimize daylight, reduce glare, and manage heat, all while maintaining unobstructed views of the outdoors. No curtains or interior window coverings in the way. Visit sageglass.com to see this groundbreaking technology for yourself. And with that, let's jump into today's show. Daryl Condon, welcome back to the business of architecture. Happy to be here. So in our last episode, we touched slightly on the idea that you have about uh, a multidisciplinary practice, and you kind of contrasted that with the typical architecture practice. And tell me, what do you mean by that? Well, you know, I think the traditional business model of architecture has been architects within a firm, you know, consulting with engineers and other sub-consultants in, in different firms. Um, and obviously, there's a multitude of different approaches. For some firms have interior designers or landscape architects, and some firms uh, integrate the structural, mechanical, electrical engineering within within their practice. And I think the sort of engineering interdisciplinary model uh, is is probably far more prevalent than than the model uh, that we're that we've embarked on. Because what we're uh, what we've uh, what we're doing is bringing uh, different design disciplines. So communications design, graphics design, industrial design, fashion design, um, different design disciplines into our practice, uh, which enables us to bring a, a wider range of design thinking to our to our, our, our projects. Okay, well, in the materials you sent over, you say that you feel that every firm should employ a fashion designer. Why is that? And what do you mean by that? Well, uh, so this is an interesting story. So um, as we've been looking for different people within our, our firm, um, we've been very open to uh, bring people in with diverse backgrounds. And so we, we had an opening for our office manager. Uh, and we didn't call it that when we put the, uh, the job posting out. Um, we, we had a very vague job posting, uh, very intentionally, because we wanted to see what kind of different types of thinking that, that would emerge. And in the end, the individual we hired uh, came from a fashion design background. And so she joined us um, uh, really to become an office manager from a fashion design background and uh, stayed in that role for, for a year, uh, really helpful to bring uh, discipline and structure to our office systems. But what quite, re quite quickly we realized that there was a, um, 
uh, a structure in the way that she approached design thinking that came from her background that was really interesting to us, both in terms of strategic insight, uh, trends forecasting. Um, but the, the thing that, that, that stands out, um, and if I step back a moment, one of my beliefs is that architects quite erroneously think that we can do everything, that, that we, we, we're experts on, on graphic design, on, on interior design, and all these other. And, and I think that there's a real problem in the architectural profession and a lack of respect for the unique skills that these other design disciplines bring to the table. And so um, one of, one of the, the tangible examples is we were having a discussion on, our project, uh, on a project, and it was a discussion on materials and color. And so we invited uh, uh, the fashion designer in, into this conversation to contribute to the discussion. And what, what we immediately realized is that through her training, her understanding of color uh, went so far beyond anything that any of the architectural staff within our firm um, had uh, because of her training. Uh, and so now, what, you know, what we realized is that to bring that type of depth of understanding of that aspect of design into our architectural projects is really powerful, right? So it's, it's a really tangible example of when you open yourself up and you say, no, we're going to respect that these other design disciplines have a unique skill and education and, and, and mindset and that our projects will benefit from that. Um, so it's a, for us, it's a really tangible example of, of, of the impact of bringing in a, a different type of designer into the practice. So when you talk about communication design is one thing you mentioned. You mentioned graphic design. Uh, you've mentioned fashion design. How would each of these people play a role in the services that you offer your clients? So um, it's, been, it's been really fascinating. Um, you know, we started slowly. We, we brought in... Um, uh, one uh, communication designer and and a, an individual who had run a uh, a branding company, uh, and we started slowly. And our goal was that within a year, if we could sort of pay their salaries with the additional work that we'd be doing, okay, right? And ignoring overhead and ignoring profit, and just saying we'll take a very um, uh, uh, simple approach. And the the logic that I use when we're introducing a design, design discipline is really simple, is that within the first year, we bring in enough fee to pay that salary. All of the service that they're providing on the architectural projects is like bonus, right? It's, it's, it's value add, right? Um, but what happened uh, was quite different, uh, was that quite quickly, our clients caught wind of this, this uh, skill set that we had within the office. And within a year, uh, you know, we were four people in that department, and now we're, we're closer to, to 10. Um, and that's without any direct marketing of that skill set. Uh, it's been through word of mouth, and it's been through um, uh, just clients looking over the shoulder and going, wait a minute, you guys do that? Uh, and as we've started to, to apply that skill set to our architectural projects, other clients have seen that and said, wait a minute. How do we get that? Um, and, and so it's really been um, uh, sort of the inertia of that side of the practice has been strictly word of mouth and through people seeing what we're doing. Uh, and so it's been really fascinating. So a lot of our work has been lateral through our existing clients or existing projects where we, you know, we did a museum project that led to a, um, a branding, a rebranding of the museum. What emerged through the design process is that the, they needed to update their brand. And so our branding team got involved and rebranded the museum. So that's an example. Uh, we see it a lot in the front end in the public consultation where we're bringing the communication design, website design, and interactive design into, into public consultation uh, or communicating with the public. So it can be a lot of, a lot of different things. Um, we've also found clients outside of the realm of architecture quite fascinated with this sort of mixture of design disciplines that have come to us for, for design exercises. Uh, I have to say that we've had a lot of success extending laterally into the, the realm of our architectural projects. We haven't had as much success as I would like at this point in terms of really solidifying a body of work outside of, of a sort of traditional area of our practice. And so that's for us the next step as we, as we build this model is, is um, uh, you know, uh, great, gaining greater traction uh, outside of the realm of architecture and the built environments uh, where, where, where the logic of that has become immediately apparent to our clients. Now, in terms of 
uh, the business entity itself. Is this this small team that you have inside the uh, inside the larger firm? Do you run it as a separate business entity where you're actually tra- tracking some profitability of that unit, or do you just bundle everything together as the firm? It, it's all within the same firm, um, and uh, we are putting systems into place to look at it as sort of a subgroup uh, business group. Uh, you know, one of the one of the reasons why we're doing this um, beyond the design impact is is also a belief that our processes from a from a whether it be a project management system or a business system a project tracking system that we can learn from uh, the way other design disciplines work in terms of their business model as well and bring bring that that thinking and that's been one of the areas of greatest challenge for us is um, for, and I'll give you an example. Um, you know, a typical architectural project may last three, four, five years. And so the cadence of that, which we're all used to and comfortable, is completely different than a communication design project that might last two, three, four weeks. Uh, so the pace of the projects and the the scale of the projects also being so much smaller imposes a discipline within the communication design. What we've come to understand is that the discipline in terms of how you organize yourself, how you manage those projects, uh, how you bring that work in on an ongoing basis is very different than, than a, an architectural practice. And, and we firmly believe, and, and, um, and I think we're seeing that, that we can learn from that and that it's going to make us stronger. And I think that those design disciplines can learn from architecture as well. And we think there's a cross-pollination potential uh, as a result of of learning from those from at a systems level uh, and so that that for us is a work in progress i'd love to say that we've we've mastered that um but you know it's only been a couple of years that we've been really vigorously on this path and um and so it is still a work in progress in our last episode you talked about as you've grown um that it's kind of stretched your systems right that you had kind of 50 60 people systems that work pretty well 30 uh, but then grew to 80 and now it's it's sort of time to go back and take stock of things specifically what kind of systems are you talking about daryl that you guys are now going back to update probably the most uh uh we're looking at really at all of our systems whether they be hiring processes um or, or hr systems but the most significant is our project management and project tracking you know our resource allocation systems you know when we were 30 or 40 people, um, you know, you could manage your resources pretty much in your head. You know, you had a good sense of what everybody was doing, what the status of those projects were and where to move people around. And, and then at some point you reach a, you cross a threshold where all of a sudden you can't, and it becomes so difficult to, uh, to understand where those, those hills and valleys are in the workload so you can move people around and, and get your efficiency where you need it to be on, on projects. And so the most significant system for us right now is, is uh, refining our, our project tracking and uh, resource allocation system uh, so that we can better, better manage that. And what, what tool do you use for that? Um, we're, we've been experimenting with a number. Uh, we use a JIRA for our accounting system. And so we've been uh, uh, looking at how we can integrate the, the, the functionality and the modules within that, with that, that system. Um, you know, oftentimes it's, it's good old fashioned Excel spreadsheet that enables you to, to, to do that tracking quite effectively as well. So we have a bit of a hybrid model where some of it's within our, our accounting system and some of it's uh, in a, in a, you know, nested layers of, of, uh, Excel spreadsheets. And we're still refining that, um, to be honest, we haven't had the success we'd like to have a fully integrated system um, that suits us. Um, and so uh, we're kind of going back and forth and kind of gone back to a, to a simpler, uh, more Excel-based uh, system for, for that. Awesome. Well, Daryl, let's just finish up by talking about your ideas about the future of architecture. I know you have some definite thoughts about this. Please share. Yeah. Uh, you know, when architects get together, you know, it's quite common uh, to, to, to hear the litany of complaints and criticisms about where the, where the profession is and how, you know, we're losing this and people don't respect us for that and, and all, of the, all, of the ask, all of the challenges that, that are real. Um, you know, we believe that um, there are a tremendous number of 
uh, the challenges that the profession faces and, um, and that we need to, um, uh, but we, but we need to respect the conditions that are causing those challenges. And too often we feel that, that architects, uh, are looking, uh, for someone to change it in our interest to go back or to, um, to see it our way. Uh, and, and, and I think what, what we're trying to do is encourage a shift where uh, we need to see it, we need to understand better the forces of change, and we need to respect the forces of change around us and adapt our practices in response to that. Because the, 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 the pressures that are causing the changes within our systems are real, and they're not going away. And in fact, the, those pressures are increasing. So we look at the, the pressures on the traditional delivery model. We know that that uh, time is is getting tighter and tighter, uh, and that uh, all all we're being squeezed uh, from both sides at the design end, at the construction end, and that we've been asked to do more with less in a shorter period of time. That's our reality. We need to accept that. We need to adapt to that. Uh, at the same time, we believe there's other opportunities for architects that go beyond traditional practice, both at the beginning and in, in, in before projects exist as traditional projects and after projects exist. And that we're looking to expand our service offerings before and after uh, as a way to relieve some of that pressure. And we're also looking to uh, sort of, sort of a more horizontal uh, expansion before and after, and then of sort of a more vertical expansion uh, through interdisciplinarity and bringing different design disciplines and enables to take on more more aspects of the design through those uh, traditional practices as well so for us it's kind of a it's moving in both both directions and uh, uh, and just accepting that some of the things that are happening to our profession are beyond our control and, and unless we we really accept that uh, we're putting our practices in jeopardy now uh, in terms of the after uh, you mentioned some services. What would be some examples of services that you might offer after the project is over? Well, one one of the one of the simplest is is just simply taking post occupancy evaluation and adjustment much more seriously. Uh, I think too often architects are guilty of of sort of being afraid to look at the impact of their projects and going back and actually talking to the people that use their buildings and 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 understanding if they worked. You know, do they work? Where are the challenges? Um, I believe that uh, that there's a service offering that when we really embrace learning from the impact of our work and learning from the true results of our work, that we can go to our clients and say, look, we've been studying how that building is operating. Here's the things that didn't quite work out or here's the things that have changed in terms of the, the operation or the, or the functional issues we think there's a way to tweak your building. We think there's a way to make some simple modifications and get greater efficiency and greater impact. That's an example of, of treating the building not as a through the life cycle of the construction phase, but really through the life cycle of the building and saying, well, what if we went back in five years and said, what if we tweak this? What if we went back in 10 years? What if we went back in 20 years? Um, so we think that there's, there's opportunities to, to go back and help our clients uh, think of their buildings more like musical instruments that need tuning from time to time, um, and, and I, I think I don't think we do that often enough. And I don't, and I, so I think that's that's an example of of where we can we can go beyond. Um, we can also, I think, increasingly, the type of skill set that we have and the type of problem solving that we bring, the sort of multivariable uh, problem solving. Some some have referred to as wicked wicked problems. Uh, the way that we think uh, are so well. Uh, suited for the dynamics of, of organizational decision making, uh, whether it be governance structures or or, or simple um, just the way that uh, organizations communicate amongst themselves. I think that the boundaries between the physical design and the social, the sort of physical construct and the social construct are merging, and and increasingly. Uh, we can have impact on both and adjust the physical to suit the the the, the social. So it sounds like what I'm hearing from you, Daryl, is that you feel the the solution that's going to emerge from the pressures on the industry is more interdisciplinary practices and then also integrated uh, horizontally as well as service delivery. Yeah, absolutely, and that we get involved earlier, helping our problems define problems 
helping them understand their problems before, you know, oftentimes it's not a physical solution that is needed, you know, and we, we shouldn't be afraid of going to our clients, help, asking them about their problems, helping them and, and say, you know, you don't need a building, you know, you need to tweak your organization. That, that should be a, a, something that is natural to us as, well, here's a physical solution. Um, and I think that will gain additional trust and people will, can, will see, see us in a, in, a, in a different light. Awesome. Well, Daryl Condon, thank you for joining us. Pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. And that is a wrap. If you enjoyed today's show, you'll love my Freedom Firm webinar that goes over the three principles that you need to apply to create a firm that has less fires and more fun. This is a 60-minute free online training. You can get access by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar. If you'd like to discover the cutting edge information about how to consistently bring in uh, attraction, how to attract and find and attract the kind of clients that you want to work with, go check out the free 60 minute presentation that I've put together available online. You can get access to that by going to architectwebinar.com. I really hope you enjoy those two presentations. There's a lot of valuable information there. Now, Today's episode is sponsored by Gusto and Sageglass. Gusto is a done-for-you payroll service that makes it easy for you as a small firm practitioner to manage your payroll, pay your taxes, and onboard new staff. They have a lot of very cool technology tools that makes it easy peasy to run your payroll. In fact, clients report that it takes seven minutes on average to run their payroll with Gusto, which makes it a lot easier than what you may currently be doing. You can also add benefits and HR support to take care of your team and keep your business safe. So, Look, if you're getting ready for 2019 and you want better payroll, now is a great time to start. As a podcast listener, get three months free when you run your first payroll. Go to gusto.com forward slash BOA to get your free three months and support the show. Sageglass is the manufacturer of highly intelligent, reliable, dynamic glass. Sageglass tends automatically to optimize daylight, reduce glare, and manage the heat for the people who inhabit your buildings. Visit sageglass.com to see this groundbreaking technology for yourself. And lastly, I need to remind you that the views expressed on this show do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.